Warning, Star Trek from the holodeck contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue to listen. Walk it alone! Fire. Holodeck 3 program is reinstated. Open sesame! Commander Klingon vessel. We are energizing transport of evil. Now. Hello, welcome everybody to Star Trek from the Holodeck. I am Michael Flores, the captain of the USS Rain Man Digital. I like and that. um my XO or first officer who would not be loyal, who would probably sell me out to Starfleet. Hello, David. For those Jerry Ryan nudes, you're damn right I would. <laughs> For the Jerry Ryan nudes? Like, wait, hold on a second. Am I Am I the one that's guilty of taking nudes without her knowing it? And then you turn me in? Or are you taking the nudes? Or are you going to get nudes by turning me in? I think getting nudes and then turning you in by turning you in. Jesus, you're a creep all the way. I don't care what the answer is. You're a fucking creep. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we had some weed introduced into the world of Star Trek. I don't know what that's about. Oh, yeah, that was that was that was interesting. It's called snake leaf. Snake leaf. I was like, give me some of that. Sticky Icky Raffi. Is that her name? Raffi, right? Yeah, Raffi. Yeah, dude. I was like, yeah, Captain Picard, pass me that joint. <laughs> dude, it, it it looks so much like a vape pen. Well, well, I was that's, cracking I'm, up at yeah, that. I'm, I'm sure that was a real vape pen. I'm sure you're going to be able to buy it on eBay really soon. <laughs> smoke that Klingon green. That, smoke that Klingon, was it Kush? Yeah. Kush. Smoke that Klingon Kush. <laughs> Yeah, so weed, it's now canon, Dave. Weed is now canon in Star Trek. How do you how does that make you feel? Makes me feel really good actually. Because I mean, you know what? Star Trek, we need advancements in medical science, and that's one medical advancement. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, sure it causes hallucinations and other side effects. Eh, I'll be fine. Eh, side effects. Who cares? <laughs> uh there was some information dropped on this particular strain of plant on Star Trek Wiki. It is called snake leaf, and it was a type of flowering plant, though not native to planet Earth. It could be grown and harvested on Earth, including areas with desert environments. In the late 24th century, snake leaf was frequently smoked by individuals seeking a euphoric high. <laughs> in other words, it's basically weed for the Star Trek universe. And dude, I love it that basically the Star Trek wiki was so fast. Oh, r- they, r- they are on it. They are on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So things move into place as we form what looks to be the beginning of the new crew, new faces, new reveals. The story has officially started. It took three episodes, but damn, was it worth the wait? This episode started with another scene from the past. I'm thankful they are doing it this way. If we're going to delve into the past, I rather it be done this way, opposed to a traditional hackish flashback. People who are not new to our shows are well aware of my feeling on flashback sequences. It's an overused hackish maneuver there's no reason to use flashbacks as much as people do these days and i'm fine i'm fine with non-linear so long as it's not an excuse for bad writing that inability to tell a linear narrative without hearkening back to fill in the gaps yes we both know that linear character and plot progression has become a very difficult thing for many writers of tv Oh, yeah, especially in TV. TV is the biggest abuser of the flashback. And we could thank Lost for that. (laughs) Yes. I I mean, what was originally a stylistic choice, like in the case for Lost, now has become an inspirational crutch for others. 
Yeah. I mean, Lost used it and it worked for what they were doing. It was unique to use that type of flashbacks. They use nonlinear storytelling and then flash forwards. And then suddenly everyone and his mother is like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And now you see an entire generation of writers who are not able to tell stories in a progressive linear fashion without saying, oh, you know what? I'm going to go back and fill in the gaps here because I can't explain a character and his motivations in a normal linear fashion. Yes. So that being said, excuse my diatribe, that being said, I'm okay with these types of nonlinear decisions for writing. It works. They use them as a bit of a teaser and then boom, we're right back where we started in the last, we're, we're right back where we left off from the previous episode. Yeah. Especially when you use it in the very beginning of your episode, that's fine in my opinion, because then just like what you said, it doesn't feel like the writer is trying to fill in the gaps. Right. He, he starts his episode with the, with the, the issue at hand and trying to explain, okay, this is what the, this is what the issue is in this episode. And this is the beginning of it. Right. Bang. Now, if we had gone back again, numerous times throughout the episode, back to that moment in time where Rafi and Picard had split ways you know picard leaving starfleet and raffi being fired then i would have been like jesus christ why are we doing this there's no reason for that there's no reason for it but it was sparing it was used sparingly and i'm okay so if we're going to see moments from the past how they've done it so far works for me uh they used it this week to introduce us officially to raffi uh sean luke picard's first officer during the romulan evacuation she's an interesting character and we'll get into her a lot more during our second segment we also got our first glimpse of Hugh the Borg. That was awesome. And I'm not sure how I feel about his reintroduction. Kind of felt like they threw us in the midst of something without any context. Who's Hugh? What's he been up to? Is this his life's work now? It just, we haven't seen him in over 25, 30 years. Oh, and- especially if you, especially when you put it into context of now, I'm just speaking as a as a person who is a hardcore Trekkie fan. Right. Hardcore Trekkies know who Hugh is. Right. And the importance of his story in regards to Picard and the Borg. And suddenly you just drop him in there. Right. And, and I have to um, have to think that they chose this specific character to bring out of all the characters you could bring back. This character was brought back for a very specific reason. I mean, just going back in terms of you know to in terms of uh, of theme thematically speaking i mean hugh's storyline was very powerful in yeah. that tng episode so unless they're going to use him in some way that continues that line of thinking uh, i i don't even understand why they would bring him back and yeah. that, so that being said felt like the way they handled his introduction was very clumsy and we're going to get into that as well because we're going to kind of go through the many twists and turns of this week's narrative. Uh, There are illusions and I understand what they're trying to do. They didn't want to pull back the curtain without giving away too much about Soji because apparently the, there are illusions to the show's mystery that involves this character a lot more than her simply being data's daughter now, um, which I'm happy with that. Uh, This and more, we have a lot to get into Dave, but before we move forward, Give me your initial thoughts on this episode in a nutshell. My initial thoughts of this episode was I it this one was a very confusing episode for me. I was very torn about it because on one hand, I love the little callbacks, I love the little Star Trek nods and it made there are moments in this episode that made me clap and stand and applaud the musical cues exactly yeah. stuff like that were fantastic i like bringing up using. Picard's accomplishments the mention of q the mention of q uh, the, the mention of the borg invasion there you're right there are a lot of things that make you kind of get giddy as a trek fan yeah and the the way they tackled they continue to ca- tackle Picard's story which is this aging man trying to deal with you know, changes in his life, 
big changes. Like his whole ideals are being challenged and having to let go of the one thing that basically he worked his whole life on that stuff. I dug, but I was very, the, the, the episode to me felt very clunky with like introduction of several characters like uh, the, uh, the, the pilot, the new pilot of the ship, the doctor, even like what you mentioned, dropping a, a character like Hugh out of nowhere. Yeah. When he should, ha- if this is, if this character is supposed to be really important, he should have actually showed up like what? Episode one, uh, even just a glimpse, a glimpse of yeah. him. Yeah. And I mean, off so, the, off the air, you and me were discussing about it is kind of like you mentioned about that one moment when he's watching her on the monitors. Why wasn't that in episode one? Yeah. That would have been fit perfectly. Right. There. So you feel like this episode had a lot of high profile Trek moments that make you feel good as a Star Trek fan, but there's but, just something uh, off about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. That's a fair assessment, Dave, because I agree with you quite a bit. Um, as a Star Trek fan, this episode was effing amazing. I love seeing Picard get a crew and how it happened, in my opinion, felt organic. I'm glad when it comes to this specific aspect, it took three episodes. You know, you have the new character, Cristobal. Chris Rios is awesome, and his holographic crew are fantastic. And, and and better, you know, and they better be an ongoing part of this show. I love it. The the HM, what's it called? EMH. The EMH, and then the ENH, which is something new. We've never seen that before. Apparently, there's now a holographic program for every needed crew yes. <laughs> member, which I think is cool. And honestly, for me, he might be one of the more interesting characters in this show so far. The character ingredients are fascinating. A man that has turned his back on Starfleet because of opposing ideology or due to a controversial decision that was made by Starfleet. Either way, I feel like he syncs well with Picard and where he's at currently in his life and how he feels about Starfleet. So I, I feel like there's room for their relationship to really grow and solidify. So I like that part, but outside of that, there were some writing issues that I had problems with and we'll break them down throughout our discussion this week. I don't want to be too negative because I don't want people to get the idea like uh, that. We didn't like the episode, Because I really did like the episode. I found myself giddy clapping at numerous times. Uh, So I did enjoy it. But there are some issues that feel a lot like Star Trek Discovery Season 1 issues. Season 2 of Discovery was astounding. Just amazing. Absolutely, yes. Season 1 had some issues. And I feel like... This show, three episodes in, might be falling into that territory. I'm hoping it doesn't. I'm maintaining optimism. I'm maintaining Starfleet optimism, if you will, David. Yeah. Yeah. But let's bring it back to Cristobal briefly here. Uh, The way we found out he was ex-Starfleet was awesome. And it was one of the moments in this episode's writing that I thought was really well done it was handled correctly the way Bacard described him the way Bacard described Cristobal was needed it needed to happen in that way we as an audience need to know what we are watching and we are watching Star Trek with crew with a crew with similar ideals that we are familiar with because if we don't know anything about Cristobal, what do we think he is? Some pirate that's, you know, a yeah. captain for hire. But to have Picard, number one, show that he understands the moment he walks. First, it shows how observant he is, how he's on, you know, his toes, how he's not as old as they're treating him as if he's a man who is on the borderline of of being senile and has no concept of what's going on around him. This is a man who is just as sharp as he was 
uh, the very first time we saw him on the bridge of that Enterprise. Yeah. So I love that moment. It shows how observant Picard is, even in his later years. And at the same time, it says a lot about that character, Cristobal. Very easy character development. It's some of the best character development we've had in the show because it's done in a matter of five seconds. And it's done intelligently. Yes. Okay? The, I agree with you that his introduction was very well done because the other introductions just seem so clunky. Well, we, yes, the, the Hugh situation, yeah. the situation with uh, Soji. It's Soji just, we, and we, we just now realized in this episode that she does know that she has a sister. We have been like, okay, do they know of do each other? Do they know each other? Yeah. It's, it's what, very, it, it's very, it was at first it expressed that, oh, they don't know anything about each other. She's a doctor, but she's like 19 years old. I, I, I didn't even know she was a doctor. Did you know she was a doctor? No. But, but then her sister is in college. So it, <laughs> there's a lot of confusing aspects. And that's why when I look at this episode, crystal ball was handled so seamlessly and it shows you, I'm using this aspect to highlight my point. It shows you how character, proper character development can be done in a matter of seconds. Yes. And then we can move on because at this moment, episode three, I feel like I know more about Cristobal than I know about Hugh, that I know about Raffi, that I know about the Romulan um, vineyard people. Yes. I understand that this is a man that faced some type of trauma that has stuck with him so much that he had to leave Starfleet starfleet or was pushed out and he refuses to look back or even deal with it to the point to where he turns off his holograms when they want to talk to him about it <laughs> so this is all done in in a matter of moments it's an excellent way to flesh it out a character and i'm hoping we get more of that with some of these other characters because as of right now where we're at i feel like we're just being tossed names and faces and we're waiting for those connections to be made and we're not quite getting them. Yeah. And like the, the amazing thing that when I think about it now, Cristobal's introduction, the strength behind it too, was connecting it with Picard because this is the one time that we get to see Picard as we know him, how he can be psychologically that sharp, at like seeing right through his crew members and seeing what type of person they are. That's what made Picard great. That's why his interactions, it reminded me of like the interaction he would have with Riker whenever they'd have their talks inside the captain's ready room and Riker would just saunter on in and sit awkwardly on the seat and they would suddenly start chatting to each other and Picard would pick Riker apart but we learned so much more about uh, Riker at that point because of what Picard's doing. This was like that. And I thought that, yeah. yeah, it is like a genius way of doing it because you're tying it to number one, you're tying it to Picard. And thanks to Picard, now we can fully kind of understand this character now. Yeah. And at the same time, we it says a lot about Picard. So if you look at the Raffi thing, the one thing that irritated me about the Raffi moment was kind of like, okay, I get why she might be angry but it's like picard doesn't do anything for her there's no story that basically connects it you know as organically as it did with cristobal with raffi it felt very clunky it felt forced because you're just coming from that from that uh uh flashback and suddenly she's smoking weed on a desert planet well, I think and I think the how she get there. <laughs> I think the problem with that with her character is that they're trying to create a mystery around her intentions and her motives. I don't think it's going to be anything nefarious. I don't think she's trying to plot against Picard, but obviously there's a whole other storyline going on that pertains to her and why she wants to get to Free Cloud. Is that what it's called? Free Cloud. Yeah. And I think because of that, we're left with not a lot of through development on her character is she interesting yes my interest is yeah. peaked and i feel like they've done their job um but they they're adding this mystery behind her character and i'm a little nervous because we have mystery now behind data's daughters yes we have mysteries now behind commodore O. Oh. we have mysteries now behind 
the Romulans that were assimilated, which is a big issue because they're saying they're the only Romulans to ever be assimilated. And I have proof and evidence that is completely inaccurate. So that's another problem. We have mysteries behind who the Romulans are that are that are trying to kill Picard. Yes. Hopefully these all come together, which I, I imagine they will. But this is why I said it a few moments ago that it looks like they're falling into the same pitfalls that the first season of Discovery did. Yeah. It's a mentality that a lot of writers want to do nowadays. It's that I'm going to blow your fucking mind away <laughs> with this reveal. And that was our biggest problem with Discovery season one. They focused so much on misdirection because they didn't want us to figure something out that the misdirection literally fizzled and meant nothing that because meant nothing it was end. actually misdirection for misdirection. There were two elements that were misdirection. The first aspect of misdirection was there to make sure we didn't understand one aspect that they were going to reveal. But the other reveal was also misdirection <laughs> for the big reveal of season one. And, yeah. the pre and they amounted do nothing <laughs> because they they're trying anything. to focus on blowing our minds rather than simply telling a really good thought out story. Yes. And we're only three episodes into Picard. I don't have any passionate issues with it yet. It may sound like it, but we're doing our job. We're just breaking things down. Yeah. Just breaking it down. And, and right now, and I've been doing this for a very long time. We've been told by numerous actors and showrunners that we understand TV and it blows them away how well we can figure things out. And I'm saying right now, three episodes in, I see issues with the show. Same here. And I'm a little nervous. Because you can't, you can't deny that basically when you take a look at these three episodes... The chinks in the armor are there. Oh, that's racist, David. <laughs> Not those type of chinks. Uh, but the 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 cracks the cracks in the ar armor are there. To the point that basically they look very similar to past mistakes in other shows. You can't deny that. Yeah. Because like let's face it, I think the first three episodes, it feels like they're trying to really, really ride the shoulders of Patrick Stewart. Hey, it's Picard. Well, it is Picard Day. Yeah. So so all the fans will just swarm in mass to us because it's Picard. Okay, so you're tr okay, so you're you're going back to what we discussed off air. Yeah. Where I said if you remove Patrick Stewart from this show. Yes. And let's say it's a show about an aging captain. And Starfleet. And it's the same story. He left Starfleet because he didn't agree with their decision. And this was the show we were watching. Would there be excitement and A plus reviews? And and I was really happy when you brought that up. And I don't and we don't think there would be. And if if you remove the light Patrick, bulb went in my head. Yeah. If you right. remove Patrick Stewart from it, the nostalgia's gone and suddenly we're left with a show that we're trying to figure out what we're watching. All right, so let's get into the the meat of this episode now that we kind of broke down everything from an academic standpoint, from a technical standpoint. And we're going to be going back and forth because that's what we do. And there's a lot of different things going on in this specific episode. Now, the writers of Picard pulled the curtain back just a smidge to reveal a bigger mystery. We've narrative of. And perhaps this could even be called the first season's official myth arc. I'm sure we will learn more in these subsequent episodes, but it looks like everything's pointing to the sisters, Daj and Soji. Yes. Apparently, they're now connected to some Romulan myth. But this is also where this episode gets a bit tangled up and feels a bit unsteady. Because there's a lot of words being thrown at you, ideas being thrown at you, and you're kind of left trying to make heads or tails, much like the Romulan lady was putting together a puzzle. Yes. That's how I felt trying to put this together and make heads or tails of what was being said. Now, it's relatively simple when you break down verbatim, which is what I did on paper as I was writing as I was watching the episode, 
it's it's pretty simple, but we're also left to interpret and draw connections that we hope are there. And I'm hoping these words are not just simply there as misdirection, but they will, in fact, lead to something definitive. So let's break down this aspect a bit more in depth for clarification, and then we will talk about it as we go. Okay, Dave? Okay. So how the Romulans gained control of a Borg cube was answered, but with that came a dozen more questions. Questions. Now, based on what we watched in the early 20 in the early 23rd 2380s the borg cube entered romulan space in the beta quadrant and encountered the scout ship shanar one of the 26 passengers was ramda the foremost expert on romulan mythology does yes. that sound correct so far yes okay Soon after the Romulans were assimilated, the Borg cube underwent a sudden submatrix collapse. And that's one of the questions that I have. The why. And I'm sure that's what we're leading to. One of the mysteries of this show, of the first season, will answer why there was a sudden submatrix collapse that separated the Borg cube from the collective. Now, if I'm not correct... One of Hugh's lines basically stated that the Borg Q collective looked at the collapse and just severed ties with that that area. Correct. They said the Borg collective immediately severed its link to the cube, permanently deactivating it and all of the drones within. Yes. Now, there's a big question there as well, because I correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. It's very well known in Star Trek canon that the Borg returned for their dead. Yeah, that's that That was one of the biggest things about the storyline of Hugh was the fact that the Borg were coming back to come and get him. In fact, <laughs> there was an episode of Star Trek Voyager during season three where they found a Borg cube that was adrift and they were paranoid to activate it again because it could afraid that the Borg, another Borg vessel would show up to claim the dead. Now, I can't imagine the writers of Star Trek Picard just kind of forgetting that because that that was a major part yeah. of it, Star Trek canon. I mean, it's been stated numerous times. So I'm assuming that this sub matrix collapse is, is something, something big. entirely different. It yes. severs them and they may be afraid of it. They may be afraid of this type of, you know, Thing that severs the collective and that is why they just abandon it and leave it alone yeah and all of this occurred during the midst of the romulan supernova crisis very likely without the knowledge of the united federation of planets so while the romulans are trying to figure out what they're going to do to survive a borg cube enters romulan space this all has to be connected in some way otherwise you get the big question marks again why 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 will the Borg decide to attack the Romulans in the middle of a supernova, especially since they've already been defeated numerous times in this area of space? Uh-huh. And we have to remember the events of Voyager and the fact that the Voyager team kind of put an end to the Borg. So there are some things that definitely need to be worked out. Uh, the crew of the Shanar were the only Romulans, Romulans ever assimilated by the Borg, according to this episode. And yet there was another Star Trek Voyager where a Romulan was assimilated and became independent. Yes. So th there's some. Now there is a different. Uh, you could make the argument. Well, maybe they don't know of that Romulan since it was in another part of space. Yeah, it was. In, okay. It was a different quadrant. Yeah. And it was far away. Fine. OK. Yeah. I will. I will suspend belief and say, OK, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm assuming from all of the information they, they gave us that the Romulans were the direct cause of the submatrix collapse. It, it sounds like okay. it. Okay. That's possibly the because these 26 Romulans were members of the Zot Vash. Zot Vash, yeah. Okay. And remember, the Zot Vash are the ancient Romulan sect that allegedly has 
hatred of all artificial life forms and the Borg being cyborgs could be the ultimate source of their disgust. It would make sense. The meshing, make sense. the meshing of artificial and organic, that's an abomination to them. So I'm assuming that their knowledge, their hatred, something they knew scared the Borg. Their knowledge created this submatrix collapse. That's those are the lines that I'm connecting. I don't know if you were reading between the lines as well. There was a lot of smoke and mirror talk. No, there of, was. So that's kind of what I was able to gather from gather partially from that whole scene in this episode. Yeah, for me, the whole thing about it was they really it seemed like they were trying to put out there in Star Trek, which is something different, the power of religion, okay. religion and faith. Right. Okay. And, but David, I have one question for you. What does God need with a starship? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was coming. I knew that was coming. Like that's, a, that's the vibe I got, which was different for me seeing that in Star Trek. Yeah. But I like it. I like actually that basically, Hey, this, technological race of the Borg being scared of something. Right. And also the, the mythological aspect, you know, yes, we have that connection. Ramadad, Ramad. Let's, is it Ramad? Let's just say Ramad. Yeah. Let's say Ramad. Ramad and Data's daughters appear to be at the center of all this. And the perceived mythological aspect of the episode I feel, Dave, and correct me if I'm wrong, you disagree. I feel like the mytho- the mythological aspect of the episode was more for aesthetics more than anything else because we know Star Trek is not typically mystic. Yeah, it's typically not mystic. So this really can only go one direction, the scientific direction. The scientific direction. And there are clues sprinkled throughout the discussion between Ramad and Soji, for example— the phrase a shared narrative framework for understanding their trauma rooted in deep archetypes, but as relevant as the day's news. Now, honestly, right now, that just sounds like a lot of words poetically pieced together. Science babble. Is it science babble? I mean, a narrative framework for understanding their trauma rooted in deep archetypes, but as relevant as the day's news. It just sounds like, symbolic phrasing yes but yeah. i'm sure these words will resonate soon i'm hoping i'm hoping because like i don't know about you but the vibe i got from this was the same type of mystery vibe i got when they talked about the red angel you remember in season two me and you were like we're, we're trying to we're trying to figure out okay what's the red angel well he he's this being that they they pictured that Oh, it's all about, you know, faith and God and angels. The difference with the Red Angel is that there was definitive statements being made about the Red Angel that we could follow. Yes. This was a lot of random words put together. (laughs) That was tough to follow. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, it could be anything. And listen, I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool, but... They're going to have to find a better way to help us work through some of those things, because I think many of us were wondering why Soji understood all of this. Yes. And while our brain is trying to see if we miss something like, did I miss something? Does Soji know this person? What is Hugh's point in the background? Does he know anything? While I'm trying to f- understand the context, they're giving us information. And then afterwards, you find out that Soji also didn't know why she knew these things. But that information probably should have been more clear at the beginning so that we could focus on what was actually being said. Because we were trying to piece together the context. Yes. Do you get what I'm saying? Because the, the information wasn't hard to follow. But I had to rewind it five times after I heard that Soji was also confused. I'm like, okay, so now I can ignore the context and just go with what they were saying because it was, it was very confusing the way it was laid out. The progressive way it was laid out was very confusing, especially because I'm still trying to figure out why he was here, what his position is like, what's what, what part does he play? Yeah. So, and, well, what do you think of Dave? Do you have any thoughts? It took me a while to actually figure it out because 
And I had to dig for research on this. No, not research. What do you think is happening? What I think is, this is my theory. They're harping, they're harkening back to a question that was brought up a long time ago in TNG about the Borg. Okay, can okay. the Borg become individuals again? It's never been actually. The cutest is the only one. John Luke is the only one to actually say, "I've broken away from the hive. I've gained my." individuality back okay, well you know? i see what you're saying but again in star trek voyager they had an entire colony an entire planet they were fine they lived i think years as individuals on the planet and then they decided to become part of their own collective in order to create peace because peace. they were warring amongst each other yeah so we know i mean also seven of nine what became an individual mm -hmm. so and these are the things that basically make me even more confused. And then it goes back to like what we kind of alluded to earlier is, is the writing hurting right now? Is the writer I don't know. being, is the writer just chasing his own tail? <laughs> you know, I like to pride myself on being smart, but you know, I, I feel like when you try to be too smart too with your smart. show yeah. that, you know, people lose sight of what they're watching, but the only thing that I could think of is a question, okay? Because there really is no way I can definitively say anything. Did these group of Romulans, while assimilated, see some glimpse into the future? I believe they said something like, there is no myth, alluding to everything happening now, which we understand that our concept of time, the human concept of time, is very different than how other alien species in the world of Star Trek view time. Oh, I think I know where you're going. And how time is okay. relative and yeah. how the past is happening at the same time as the present as and the, the present. present is happening at the same time as the future. Yes. So did they see some glimpse into the future? Are their brains confused or displaced in time? Now we already know the Borg has experimented with time travel. And I'm wondering if their minds saw something, something that this girl is going to do, whether it be positive or negative remains to be seen. Again, we already know glimpses in the future can be much like dreams or visions. It's yes. hard to interpret. And you may think one thing happened and in actuality. This is what happened. Yeah, we saw it in season two of Discovery. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's the only thing that I came to in terms of a conclusion of what was happening because Ramhad was very specific when she said myth, which myth we know means, you know, it could be real. It could be not. It's mythology. It's fictitious. Sometimes it's heightened reality. It's larger than life stories. And it typically happens in the past, right? Yes. Myth and mythology. She was very clear that no, not myth. Not now. myth. Now. And then that's why the whole statement of it being like news, like being present, relevant as relevant the day's, day's news. news. Yeah. And I, 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 I dig that thought, but man, that is, that is a idea that would be great if that was the main myth arc of the entire show. Yeah. But then you go into the fact that they introduce so many other elements. I'm worried that they might lose that. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on and we only have seven episodes left. And I feel like we barely you scratched know. the surface. Now, if this show was covering territory, covering the amount of ground that discovery season two did, then I, I wouldn't be worried. But the fact that it took us three episodes to, get into a ship and form a crew and next episode we're going to be meeting and introducing a new crew member yeah so now we're moving into episode five and we finally have the crew so there's there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot going on now let's talk about commodore o okay it does seem or it would seem that she is officially a baddie Shortly after she had questioned Jurati, Romulan Tal Shiar showed up at, at, showed up at Picard's door. Now it could be misdirection. I'm hoping it is. It's a little on the nose because it just feels ill 
ill paced if she's part of this big conspiracy why would you reveal it so quickly unless her intentions or motives are much bigger than the reveal itself so i'm okay with this let's say she is bad and you decide to show us already then her intentions and motives better be bigger than the reveal itself yeah as to why she's willing to do this but because it was so on the nose, hey, I'm working with, number one, she doesn't know she's working with a Romulan. That was clear in the yes. last episode. There's a reason why she, you now maybe she is Romulan and maybe her, her human look was for everyone else so she can walk around Starfleet, right? Yeah. Talking about the Romulan uh, spy, let's call her. Yes. Because I don't know her name currently. But... I'm thinking that Commodore O doesn't even know who she's working with. And that's why I don't think she sent the Tal Shiar. It was way too in your face. Oh, look, she sent them right after Gerardi and her conversed. Yes. Now, the thing for me is I'm thinking Gerardi isn't who she th says she is. Because her walking in at the right moment, <laughs> the right time. Thank you. <laughs> With a phase pistol or a Romulan disruptor, I should say. I thought it was on stun. <laughs> that was funny. That, that was, was funny. <laughs> it was funny. But then I was like, going, where did she come from? <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. There's like I said, there's a lot of there's mysteries on top of mysteries on top of uh, mysteries. mysteries. Exactly. And that takes us to Rafi again. Rafi has a little mystery of her own going on. She has joined Picard's crew for the time being, but she has made it clear that she's hitching a ride because she has her own destination. And it's something called Free Cloud. Now, I will say, I know you're not big on her just yet, but I feel like her past is going to be interesting to dissect. She's resourceful, connected, and very aware that the Romulans and the Federation could have been working together. That's what makes her interesting to me. Okay, yes, I will agree with you there. Um, I just, I like that. I like the, I like everything that makes her who she is so far. Her, her characterization, who we met in the opening minutes of the episode, someone who's loyal, uh, someone who felt burned by Picard, you know, that, you retire and I'm forced out. I get all that. I like that. But I'm not sure I want a mystery. Do we need every character to have a mystery? Thank you. Yes. That's the thing that bothers me about that character is like, I get her motivations. Her motivations are great. I dig it. Yeah. But then like, oh, but let's not come out and say what she's trying to do. Why? What's the point? Just you know, let her story grow organically. She doesn't need this ham-fisted mystery in place. I got to go to, I got to go to, uh, free cloud. Free cloud. Yeah. Why? It's a simple question. Why? Well, you don't need to know. <laughs> yeah. Like lady, I'll jettison you out the ship if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like I said, everything, everything that's there on paper, I feel works really well. Like if, you know, one of the executive producers were to give me the script and say, hey, here's the first three episodes. What do you think? I'm like, you got a great start here, but we need to we need to rework some things, introduce some characters earlier and maybe wait to introduce certain other certain other certain characters or just like take out take out like the forced ham fisted sense of mystery you guys want to do for every single point in yeah dude in in the series yeah it's making we me nervous it's making me nervous man it feels like discovery season two behind every door is a mystery behind every character is another mystery but what is your what's your narrative uh, yeah, what right. is your narrative and and maybe ex what is what is the myth arc i had said it's soji and dodge right yeah but and i think that is in fact the myth arc but there's also the the romulan conspiracy yeah what the Romulan conspiracy? And then we had the Borg cube, which again, I'm sure that's all going to play in together. I'm hoping if it doesn't, then we have some serious yeah. problems. Red alert, shields up. But all right, so let's talk a little bit more directly about the writing. Michael Shaban, 
continues to pull from the more recent political headlines to craft the thematics. And it works for this series for the most part. I don't think this presents a problem for audiences either, even though we're in a very heightened, you know, state in terms of politics. You know, everyone gets triggered when you mention anyone's name that you may not agree or a certain thought. We're very divisive currently, but I don't believe you have to agree with his political statement, Michael Shaban's political statement to understand the politics of this show. He's painting with a broad brush and not getting into the nitty gritty of U S politics. And that's just fine. Immigration, intolerance, fear. These are things that many nations, not just the United States have grappled with throughout the centuries. And it is a solid source of inspiration for Trek. So I don't think people need to get all up in arms about the politics, there were a few on the nose moments when Picard specifically said, you know, intolerance, fear, fear, and the issues of immigration, as we've heard throughout the last couple episodes. It, it's we're just dealing with the Romulans. It's just when certain, like when Picard does it, you can you can use Picard, yes, but sometimes when it comes out so forced, it hurts that character, and like in that very beginning. It just seemed out of character of Picard to actually be saying those type of words. Like intolerance. Intolerance and and fear. It's it's words that we use in today's society. Yeah. They're buzzwords. And I I do agree with that. Like, yes, intolerance is absolutely something. But it's these are political buzzwords that is very much in the headlines. And it kind of takes you out of Star Trek. And. You know, we're the first ones to say we've dissected the politics of Star Trek. It's, and it's amazing. Star Trek is always pulled from relevant politics and world events, but it's it's subtle, subtle. They're using it as sources of inspiration, you know, nuggets of narrative. They don't spell it out. And I, I feel I do agree with you that those opening moments where Picard said those buzzwords intolerance. And, and it's like I was like, all right, buddy. Wait a minute. This is this is dialogue that normally you would not be able you you wouldn't see the character of Picard in TNG say stuff like this. So it doesn't make sense. He uses it now. Yeah. Intolerance is a word very specific to. Generations of the 21st century. Yes. Yeah. And like especially when you take it into context when you. We've watched TNG episodes and they've even stated some words are not used anymore because that time in during that time, they're gone. They're not used as much. And suddenly the dialogue here in the very beginning seems so ham fisted to be 20, uh, our, our, our century instead of Star Trek century that it kind of took, took me out for a second, especially with, uh, the character of Jean-Luc Picard talking this way because I'm like going wait a minute this doesn't sound right it sounds like Picard's like in our timeline but he's not in our timeline that doesn't make any sense <laughs> because then we had that little spiel on the um you know classism and how Picard was relaxing in his chateau, chateau. and she's in a hovel <laughs> and listen I like that too but it's in fact, you could do three or four episodes on that. We've talked about that. We've talked about it. And, yeah. And I love it, but you're throwing too much in one episode. Yeah. Slow like so you're slow going with your with your actual plot, but let's throw in a bunch of poetic words uh to confuse people and misdirect the audience. Exactly. And yeah. then let's throw in a lot of political buzzwords and then let's throw in multiple political themes. Immigration, tolerance, fear, classism. It, it's just a lot going on. It's a lot going There's on. There's a lot. And, and listen, shy band, this is the, this is the Achilles heel of a, of a brilliant mind. Uh, Michael Shaban is a brilliant mind, but yes, sometimes absolutely. if you're allowed too much leeway as a, as an, as a introspective thinker, like Michael Shaban is, he's an intelligent man. He wants to say something. I need to say something. You see this, the power of the pen. And I, listen, I get it. But you got to pull back just a bit because there's just so much going on. And Dave, for those new listeners out there, they need to people need to realize that we break down the politics of Star Trek all the time and we love it. 
Yeah. But this is just too much, <laughs> it's too a, soon. It's like you're getting so many things in one episode when you could just take it slow. We, take we it easy. get it. We, we get, get it. We get the political landscape. We understand. Yeah. We get it. Yeah. So, but take your time for God's sakes, you know, loop us up even. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. Let don't, me don't, grab my ankles and, and, and brace myself, brace before, myself you start ramming. before you start ramming, you know, it's I all, mean, Dave, it's like a genius line in discovery season one, Harry mud. Now that's politics done right. Talk and talking about classism and, and societal issues. When he, and I'm going to paraphrase here when he says, how do you feel when you're in your starship flying over the small people forgetting that we're down here? You remember when he said that? Yeah, Holy that was powerful. Fuck, that was powerful. And it was well paced and well timed so that we can actually digest it. See, that's a better statement than what Rafi told Picard. Or even and what you're Picard essentially told saying Raffi. the same. Th- yeah. Yeah. And because it's 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 about. Writing your beats and deliveries properly. Don't just like, you know, jab us in the face with multiple jabs. Expect us. One's going to land, but all these other ones are going to miss. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. So from a Star Trek perspective, much of this works for me, despite it sounding the opposite. As a Trek fan, I can't help but get swept up in, in most of it. But as a critic, I feel like there are some issues. These issues could be due to the typical format of television we have become accustomed to. Um, They had promoted this as a 10-hour movie. And we essentially got the end of the first act after this episode, when you really break it down. Uh, This was a setup typically done in 25, 30 minutes on a normal feature-length film. Whereas here, this is the ending of the first act, and we're at about two and a half hours. So I won't be able to definitively say until the halfway point, or maybe even the actual ending of the series, if this style of writing works. This whole 10-hour movie idea. I'm open to narrative and format, you know, formatting experimentation, as long as it works for the audience and our attention, and you're hitting those, those points. Yeah, those cues, those writing cues that that, you know, bait us, reel us in, you tug the pole, you 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 cast the line, you reel us in. So we'll see, Dave. Um, This does conclude this week's discussion. Dave, give me your final thoughts. Final thoughts on this episode. Obviously, from what we uh, from what we've been saying is like this isn't the best episode of the three first three episodes. It is it is probably the weakest right now. However, just like what you said, as a Star Trek fan, I loved everything. I got giddy when <laughs> as soon as Picard said engage, I'm like going, done. Thank you. <laughs> I I can move on to the next episode now. Finally he's in space and all that good stuff. I enjoy a lot of the elements that were here. Personally, my favorite elements, even though it's one of the ones that me and you have been so hard on. Uh, the, I have a hard on right now. <laughs> uh, on the on this episode is uh, the Hugh stuff and the Borg stuff with Soji. It's very confusing. You don't know what the hell's going on. It's mystery upon mystery. However, this episode for me, that was the more enjoyable parts of the episode for me. Was, okay, I... And the problem is, I think that that is our narrative. That's what we're supposed to be following. Soji is Soji's connection to why is she important? What's the whole mystery of Data's daughters? That that's what's driving me. That's the narrative. And in this episode, th- those were my favorite parts. And I like the introduction of Hugh, but the I do see the problem that basically they just dropped Hugh on us with no explanation. Now, me as a Star Trek fan and probably other Star Trek fans out there say, basically didn't think about it because we all know the character of Hugh. Okay, we, well, this makes sense why he's here. But to a normal, everyday person, why the hell would you care about this character showing up? Doesn't make any sense. And so overall, my grade for this particular episode is a 75. 75. It's it's a good episode. 
And it has its moments, but there are cracks in the armor, just like what I said. And, and, and it, at the end of the day, the, the, it, all the problems lead to the writing. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm a little confused, Dave, and I've never found myself confused. Even when we were watching Star Trek uh, Discovery, the second half of the season, when everything kind of fell apart, I wasn't confused. Like this show, and what I mean confused is it's simple enough. Like the, everything is happening is very simple. It's what they're like the plot progression is very simple to follow, but what they're pushing into each of those plot points is it's very inconsistent and uneven. As I said, during our previous discussion, you have a lot jammed into one segment, nothing jammed to the next tons of things jammed into the next plot point, And then you have nothing jammed in the next, next plot, plot point. point. <laughs> it's very uneven. Yeah. And I'm very confused by the writing style. Very confused because even this episode, nothing really happened when you, uh, Dave, nothing really happened. I know that's a bold statement. Picard asked Raffi for a ship. Yeah. Soji spoke to a Romulan who was assimilated by Borg. We get the idea that they hate Soji and that she's dangerous. Picard's attacked by Romulans. Again. <laughs> yeah, again. He goes aboard the ship. The end. It's very simple, and yet it's not. It's and yet it's not. It's, There's... it's tangled and convoluted. Yeah. There... <laughs> it, it's like a gigantic ball of yarn. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I'm so confused with, with what's going on. I'm like, what are you guys doing? This is, and, and I feel like we're the only ones. We're, we're, we're the only ones on this island that think this way because people are blowing the show. Oh, yeah. I mean... and, and, dude, take Picard out of it. Would we be watching this right now? Exactly. And especially, David, going from Star Trek Discovery Season 2, which was fucking amazing. Right? Yeah. Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery is everything I wanted in a new Star Trek series. Just amazing work. Yes. And then now we're starting over with a new series, and I'm just like, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing? Like, we should have learned from the mistakes of Season 1 of Discovery. Um. So... I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to beat a dead horse, and we kind of already did. I think the horse is now bloody, and it's just a graphic scene of violence. <laughs> Poor horse. What did he ever do to us? It's one of those Romulans that Picard beat up. <laughs> but just to end it on a high note, I'm. I feel silly, you know, going on and on about this because it feels good. It feels like Star Trek, and I'm happy. But when I look at it, I'm happy at the Picard moments. It makes me smile. Yes. When the music hits, it makes me smile. You take that away, and what are we <laughs> what left get, with? What are you left with? Yeah. So I'm going to give this a, a 71%. I'm hoping now that the ball is rolling, we're just going to move into territory where we're going to start unraveling these mysteries. And I'm hoping we don't add any more mysteries. Because, again, if we're looking at this, like a 10 hour movie, like they had said, and this is the end of the first act, then that's the setup. And there should no longer be any more setup. If episode four is more setup, more setup we have some issues because this should be the setup. Now we spend episode four, episode five, episode six on unraveling this mystery. Episode seven and eight should be the conclusion. How, do, how we deal in the aftermath of figuring out this mystery. Yes. If we're going by what they had said, that this is a 10-hour movie. Okay? So I'm going to leave everyone with those thoughts. If you hate us, you disagree with us, then send us a message on Twitter at from the holodeck as well as Facebook.com slash Star Trek from the holodeck. I want to thank everybody for listening. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify. To search Star Trek from the holodeck. David, thank you. Thank you. Remember, live long and prosper. I couldn't help but notice your pain. My pain. It runs deep. Share it with me. End simulation.